So before we get started with the sermon today, I wanted to um, first off read a passage from Romans 13, um, and it will be out of verse 7. It says, Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. And these are things that we don't typically think about as a society as much anymore because of the fact that we don't serve a king. We don't serve an emperor. But it is a time in our society where we do actually stop to honor those who were willing to put their life on the line, those who were willing to serve our country. And so um, if you would, uh, if you're a veteran, I'm not going to ask you to stand because I know some of you can't, but if you could just raise your hand if you're a veteran and you're here with us today. And we just want to take this moment to say thank you to all of you uh, for the service that you've done to, for our country um, we, we appreciate so much um, your willingness to do that. And so now we're going to look at a different place where honor needs to be given. So we've been looking at our passion for Christ. And what that means is that we've been looking and saying, why should we be passionate about Jesus? Jesus was obviously passionate about us. Anybody that's willing to suffer what he suffered so that we could have salvation um, surely has passion, but how is it, what should we have as far as passion for him, and what can inspire us to have that passion? And so we looked first, and we saw that he was the force behind all creation, that Jesus was the one through whom all power, uh, all of creation came about. We also saw that it was always within his plan and his purpose to come to save us. He made promises from the very beginning that he would come and that he would restore things to himself. And we saw also in all of this that Jesus was willing to be the person that needed to come, the one that we needed to bring glory to God. So I, I kind of lost track of my thought there, but the third point was that he is God's glory, okay? That he is the one that comes and reflects God's nature. And so last week, we looked at the first part of this concept, which was that God revealed himself through creation by taking power over creation. He worked through Moses to show in each aspect of creation that he had power over it all. And so now what we need to see from Jesus is we need to see him as being able to have control over all creation. Because there's a lot of people that came that were good and moral. Isn't that correct? We can look and we can see there's a lot of people that reflected the heart of God. But did he show the power of God in his life? Now, I don't want to just focus on creation. Last week, we went through and we looked at how God displayed his power over creation over each day. But what I really want to look at is when we broke things, did Jesus prove with his time on earth that he was capable of repairing everything that we broke? Because we recognize that. We are the ones that broke everything. And so to do this, we want to start off in Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. It says, To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate the fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat fruit from it, or food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. And you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow will you eat the food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. So when we look at this curse, there are three things that stand out to me as things that got broken. The first was the earth. Okay, When God created everything, he said it was good. When he created us, he said it was very good, right? 
But when sin entered the world, everything that was properly in order was destroyed. We see this in our world around us now. We see it with the hurricanes. We see it with the natural disasters. We see it in our world as people are starving. They don't have the food that they need or the resources that they need. We see it in our world through sickness and death. We see it in our world today in every aspect of how our world is broken. And we see it in the way that our souls are separated from God. So we have a broken world, we have broken bodies, and we have broken spirits. So let's start with the world was broken. I want you to think about what it would have been like to live in the garden. We don't see any shelters described in the garden. There's nothing that says they built homes. There's nothing that says that they had to do anything you know, I kind of picture Eden like this weather. I told my wife, you know, if I could find some place that stays right around 40, 50 degrees at night and doesn't get up over 80 degrees in the evening, that would just be perfect. It would be an environment where you're just comfortable all the time. And I kind of picture Eden being like that. There's no description of anything that would cause chaos or disorder. But when sin entered the world, we see that our world was damaged. So the question is, was Jesus capable? Did he show us that he had the ability to restore the earth to the way that it was before? And I am going to tell you today, yes, absolutely 100%. And Jesus, I'm going to show you four examples of the way that Jesus was able to restore the earth to the way it was in the garden. The first was that Jesus had power to calm the storm. In Matthew chapter 8, verses 24 through 26, it says, Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The di disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. Now I want you to understand the magnitude of this moment. On this boat are four professional fishermen. Okay? You're not talking about people that don't understand how to be out at sea. It's not like they went to the local rental shop and got a boat. These are guys that have been on the sea all their life. From the time they were 12 years old, they were out on that boat with their dad fishing. And they're looking in this moment at the chaos of that water and saying, we're going to die. We are in serious, serious trouble. And Jesus wakes up and says, peace, be still. There was no storm so strong that Jesus did not have the power to overcome it. Another aspect of the garden that we see with them was that they had all the food that they needed. Do you notice it was part of the curse? The curse was you're going to have to toil for food now. Well, what does that imply? It implied that in the garden, Adam and Eve had anything and everything that they wanted. There was no fear of hunger, no fear of being without. And so was Jesus able to provide for the need for food? In Matthew chapter 14, verses 17 through 21, it says, We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered Bring them here to me, he said, and he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about five thousand men besides women and children. 
I want you to think about what we just read. This is a meal for a little boy. This is something his mom packed for him as he left that day to, to make sure her little boy had something to eat. We're not talking about a gourmet meal. We're not talking about a huge amount of food. We're talking about a small little platter. Something to sustain a small child. And Jesus took it. And he blessed it. And there was no one hungry. Can you imagine? Think of what our world would be like just like that, we could spread that food out all over the world. One person walks in with a bowl of rice, and it's enough to feed thousands of people. We are sustained by what we eat, by the food of this earth. And Jesus proved, yes, there is no time that you will be hungry. Matter of fact, he did it again. He fed 4,000 people in another event. Jesus proved that he was capable of returning the earth to a place where people never need worry about food again. And the last two that we see that prove that Jesus had power over all creation, all the earth, was that Jesus had the power to walk on water and allow Peter to do the same. In Matthew 14, verses 25 through 29, it says, Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, let me come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. You guys remember that when we were talking before, I told you that I believed that before the fall, that men could go in the water, could experience the fish without dying? This is the reason I believe it. You see, I believe that we, as human beings before the fall, had dominion over the earth. That's what the scripture teaches, that we had dominion over the earth. And Jesus, in walking on the water, while it is supernatural to us, I believe that that's how God designed it to be. I don't think there was stuff we weren't meant to know about. I don't think there were things that we weren't meant to enjoy, because the Bible tells us that he walked Adam along and said, tell me what the name of this is. Tell me what the name of this is. We were meant to be able to experience this place and enjoy it in all of its glory without fear of death. And Jesus not only took dominion over this earth by walking on water, he allowed Peter to do the exact same thing. <coughs> I don't know if that's powerful to you. It's powerful to me because I know I'm not Jesus. But I see a lot of Peter in me. I see a lot of too quick to talk. I see a, a lot of impulsiveness. I see a lot of who he is in myself. And when he focused his eyes on Jesus, he could walk on water. It was what we were meant to have. From the beginning, Jesus proved that in every aspect of creation, that he had power over it all. But what about us? What about our broken bodies? We experience so much pain. I'm deeply, deeply encouraged to see Sister Da and Sister Gail and Sister Rebecca here with us because they've been missing time because our bodies break down. We experience pain. We experience hurt. We become diseased. We get all of these things that happen to us. Before in the garden, none of that was real. In the garden, there was no death. There was no sickness, no pain. No sorrow. 
So then the question becomes, did Jesus demonstrate power to heal our broken bodies? Has Jesus proven that he has the power to put in order the things that were broken through the curse? And once again, the answer was absolutely yes. And he does it in every aspect of the body. I want you to think about how amazing this is. First off, we see that Jesus removes fever. Now, we know fevers typically come from some type of viral or bacterial infection, something happening inside of our body that the temperature has to spike so that we are able to burn off whatever is fighting against our body. And in Matthew 8, 14 through 15, it says, When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she got up and began to wait on him. Jesus didn't need time for it to burn off. He didn't need Tylenol or Advil. He didn't need Theraflu. He didn't need Zyrtec. The moment of that fever, Jesus walked in, and it went away. But it wasn't just viral. It was bleeding disorders. In Matthew 9, verses 20 through 22, just then a woman who had been subjected to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if only I touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. Guys, this was no small thing. If you look back in the story, which I'm going to encourage you to do, I actually would encourage you to read Matthew 8 and 9, because primarily all of these things I'm telling you about are coming out of those two chapters, Matthew's chapter 8 and 9. But you will see that this woman had invested everything she had into healing. She had gone wherever she could to try to find a way to make this bleeding stop, and she couldn't. With one touch of Jesus Carmen, one simple touch, she was healed. So virus, bleeding, what about skin disease? In Matthew chapter 8, 2 through 3, a man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately he was cleansed. As we saw last week in Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 through 8, Jesus was able to take the paralyzed man and to heal him. He said to him, Son, your sins are forgiven. Rise and walk. And the man was able to walk. Jesus gives sight to the blind. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 27 through 30, as Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him, and, they asked, and he asked them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, let it be done to you. And their sight was restored. Jesus warned them sternly, see to it that no one knows about this. We could go on to talk about all the other aspects, but I want you to understand this. Jesus was able to heal every disease of the body. Everything that has been afflicted upon us, Jesus was able to cure. So we see the curse of the earth being cleared. We see the curse of the body being cleared. But what was the most serious of all of these things is that our spirit was broken. See, the most beautiful part about the garden wasn't how easy life was. It was that every single day they were able to walk with the Lord. Man, I long for that day. I long for the day when I feel God's presence with me and that when my voice reaches out to him, 
that he speaks back. And there's no other noise, there's no other chaos. It's just simply my God and me sharing in a wonderful conversation. Our spirits were broken because we were cast out of the garden. And while God has done so many things to reach out and show us his love, to show us how deeply he wants connection with us, we still haven't reached that point of perfect union. But did Jesus show he could restore our spirit? Come on, you know the answer. Jesus cast out demons. In Matthew 17, verses 14 through 18, it says, When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire, into water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How, sh how long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy and he was healed at that moment. You see, through the cross, Jesus bound Satan. He no longer has the power he once had, but the fact of the matter is, is that he still is at work in our lives. And these fallen forces are still today working to try to manipulate us, to fall into the sins of our generations, to fall into the sins of our fathers, to perpetuate the things that have continued on. My grandmother used to say to me, John, we have an angry demonic force in our family. Adam's family's got tempers. I mean tempers. We can flare up on a dime. And I believe that there are, I don't excuse our anger, but I do believe that there are demonic forces in this world that are appealing to that. James tells us that we give in to our own evil desires. So I'm not trying to blame another force. I am responsible for me. But where do these thoughts come from? Where does this evil thought of just burst out in anger come from? It's not my natural heart. It's not what I want. And so we realize that we come from places where evil has been perpetuated in our lives. Whether it, we're being taught it by the world outside or whether it's being carried on in the world around us. But I want you to take courage. Because no matter how strong these forces feel in your life, Jesus has the power to cast them out, to bring about healing. He has the power to raise the dead. James says that as the body without a spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. And his point is that if you are not having the work along with your faith, there's, it's not alive. Nothing's happening. But the point is true too, though, that we know if the spirit leaves the body, the body is dead. The body and the spirit have to be united together. They have to be joined together. Now, the apostle John tells us that we, don't, we will receive a new body, and we don't know what that body will be like. But we know that we'll be like Christ. But we learn and we know that the body and the spirit have to be united. That our spirits are meant to live within a body. And in Matthew 9, 23 through 25, we see when Jesus entered the synagogue, leader, uh, synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and the people playing pipes, he said, go away. The girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. There is no spiritual death in Christ Jesus. Let me say that again. There is no spiritual death in Christ Jesus. Now, that last part's important. 
Because the book of Revelation tells us that there is, in fact, a second death coming to those who do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we need to take that seriously. But when Jesus walked on this earth, he proved that death had no power over his will. If Jesus said, get up and walk, the little girl got up and walked. If Lazarus was in the grave stinky and rotting, and Jesus said, arise and walk, he got up and walked. Jesus proved that the spirit could not be separated from the body so long as it was his will. That he truly was the power of God. But the greatest gift we receive is the forgiveness of sins. In Matthew 9, verses 1 through 8, Jesus stepped in a boat and crossed over and came to his own town. Some men brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This fellow is blaspheming. <clears throat> Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your heart? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take up your mat, and go home. Then the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God, who had given such authority to man. I want you to understand something. There's nothing in your world that's so broken that Jesus can't fix. There's no step you've gone too far that he can't forgive. He proved in his time here on earth that everything that is broken here, he will <coughs> renew. Now, I don't know whether God's going to somehow purge the earth that we have now and make it new. I don't know if he's going to burn it up completely and we get a new heaven and a new earth. I, that's beyond my pay grade. That's outside of my level of knowledge. And you know what? I don't care. As long as Jesus is there. It's where I want to be. But the beauty of it is that he's shown that he truly has the force to create, to restore. And so when he makes a promise, we can believe it. And he makes this promise in John 14, 2 and 3. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. I can endure anything that this earth has to throw. I can suffer loss. I can experience pain. I can take it all. And I could take it all because of one simple truth. I know the one in whom I believe. The question is, have you put your faith in him? Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Have you made him the Lord and Savior of your life? He died on a cross so that our sins could be forgiven, so that we could be restored to God. And he asked us to do something very simple, to believe in him, believe that he is the Son of God, to confess him as our Lord and Savior, to repent of our sins, to say, I want a change of mind and life. And he says to be baptized. Through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter said in Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off. If you have made that choice for Jesus, if you have given him your life and you're ready to walk in a new life, this promise of a room is yours. But if it's not, we want to offer it to you today. We want to offer that as we stand and as we sing.